All right, so we're studying in the book of Revelation, and probably most of you know a little bit about the book of Revelation. Revelation is a book of prophecy. It's talking about the future and what's going to happen in the future. It's talking about the end of time and what's going to happen at the end of time. It's talking about the end of history as we know it. It's not going to be the end of the world, though, because the Revelation, the book of Revelation, tells us that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and this new earth will be here forever. And that we're going to be in God's kingdom. On the earth. Worshiping him and living with him forever and ever. So this earth isn't going away. It's going to get a big remodel. But it's not going away. God created this earth. He made it very beautiful. And he made it for us. To enjoy and to be blessed. This earth is a beautiful place. I know we've done some things to mess it up a little bit. But God's going to fix that one day. And the book of Revelation tells us about those end times. In the end times, there's going to be a period called the tribulation period. That's where things get really bad for about seven years. It's going to be a rough time on earth. And last week we read a little bit about the Laodicean church in chapter 3 of Revelation. We found out that this church represents what the end time church will be like. And we found out that the end time church is going to be rich and self-sufficient and not leaning on God, not leaning on their faith. And I'm going to read more to you today about the end times church. Now I'm going over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. You may as well know this. That in the last days, it's going to be very difficult to be a Christian. For people will love only themselves. And they'll love their money. They will be proud and boastful. Sneering at God. Disobedient to their parents. Ungrateful to them. And thoroughly evil. They will be hard-headed and never give in to others. They will be constant liars and troublemakers and will think nothing of immorality. They will be rough and cruel and sneer at those who try to be good. They will betray their friends. They will be hot-headed, puffed up with pride, prefer good times to worshiping God. They will go to church, yes, but they won't really believe anything they hear. Don't be taken in by these people. That's pretty poignant scripture. It starts right out telling us that this is about the last days. So you don't have to wonder what he's talking about. He's talking about how people are going to be in the last days. And who are these people he's talking about? Is it the general population or is it a certain group of people? He tells us this also. He tells us that these people are churchgoers. People that call themselves Christians. As he said right here, they will go to church, yes, but they won't really believe anything they hear. In their heart of hearts, they don't really believe in the Lord. They haven't really given their hearts to the Lord. Remember last week when we read in Revelation chapter 3 about the church of Laodicea? And there was a very famous verse in that chapter. It said, Jesus was talking, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Remember that verse? That verse is written to a church. Jesus is saying to people that go to church, I, I want to come in. I want to come into your heart. Because the people in the church had not invited him in. He's knocking at the door of church people. It's so important that we learn to be real Christians. And you can see from this list here, when he talks about what Christians are going to be like in the end days, we can think of some of the people we see on TV and YouTube and on the news and people in our world today that claim the name of Jesus, but they behave in ways that are not according to God's will. Let me just read that a little bit of that again for you. Here's what these people would be like. They'll love themselves and they'll love their money. How many people we hear preaching about money all the time? 
They'll be proud and boastful. So much pride and boastfulness. Any religion that makes you feel more proud and boastful is not the religion of Jesus Christ. Jesus teaches humility and meekness. They'll be disobedient to parents, ungrateful to them, and thoroughly bad. They'll be hard-headed and never given to others. They will be constant liars and troublemakers. The Lord knows there's a lot of that going on in the world today, a lot of deception. They will think nothing of immorality. They'll be rough and cruel and sneer at those who try to be good. People are so rough today. People are so cruel today. I always tell people, in every part of your life, be a Christian. In every part of your life, live out the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5. In every part of your life, let the gifts of the Holy Spirit be shown forth. Don't take some parts of your life and think it's okay to be mean. It's okay to be cruel. It's okay to be vulgar in your language. It's okay to call names, insult people. We've got to be like Jesus in every aspect of our lives. They'll be hot-headed, and they'll be puffed up with pride. Prefer good times to worshiping God. I'm glad to see y'all made it out here this morning, in spite of some of the good times. But I know you're here because you believe in God and you want to worship God. And that's why you're here this morning. But they really don't believe anything they hear, even though they go to church. Don't be taken in by people like that. So that goes right along with Revelation, where we learn what's going to happen in the end days with the church. So the conclusion I've come to in my years of study, you know, in the book of Revelation, it talks about an individual called the beast. We call him the Antichrist. A man who's going to raise up as a world dictator and control the whole world. And he's going to be the Antichrist, meaning false Christ, pseudo Christ, pretend Christ. And he's going to have with him a religious leader, who in the Bible is called the second beast. So it's a combination of political power and religious power. And I've seen all through history of the world, anytime you combine political power and religious power, you're, looking, you're asking for trouble. You get all kinds of problems. And then you have to ask yourself, whose religion is going to be in power? You know, there are some churches that believe that Sunday is the Sabbath and you should keep the Sabbath by not working. That you shouldn't do any work at all on Sunday. And that businesses should be closed on Sundays. How many of you remember the time when they had the blue laws and businesses were closed on Sundays? A lot of us remember that. There is an example of how people's religion snuck into the government and created laws for their religion. There are other churches that believe the Sabbath is on Saturday. In fact, most of these churches believe if you don't keep the Sabbath on Saturday, you're not even a Christian, and you're going to go to hell, whatever they believe. So how fair would it be to those who have believe in a Saturday Sabbath for the laws of the country to give a Sunday Sabbath, or vice versa? Who would be in charge? What religion would be in charge? What sect of Christianity would be telling me what to do? So we see in the end times this dangerous combination happens. The, the religion and the government together grab power over the people to control them. I used to think that this religion of the end times was going to be some kind of a new age religion. I used to think it would be some kind of combination of other religions that we already have kind of blended together into a big mush and that it would be like they believe in angels and they believe in God and they believe in certain things. And, but they really wouldn't believe in Jesus Christ. But what I've come to believe, especially after reading passages like we just read about the Christian church, I believe that the great church that's going to be the evil church of the peace in the end times is the Christian church. I believe it's going to be a so-called Christian church. I don't believe it's going to be the real Christian church. Not the real church of Christ, not the real body of Christ, not the real believers. 
like I said here, they go to church, but they don't really believe what they're hearing, right? They're all about money and they're all about power. And when that Christian church, so-called Christian church, aligns itself with government and together takes over the world, that's a very scary time. And it's going to be the Christian church that is persecuting other Christians. Now, whenever I've received any persecution in my life as a Christian, it's come from the church. It's the churches that have persecuted me. It's pastors, primarily, and other church people. How many people here have felt like you've been persecuted by a church? Most of you have felt that way. So it's no surprise to us, right? We hear in the end times that it's a false Christian church that's going to be persecuted, the real Christians. Just like it is today, only it would be much worse. And back in the Bible days, who was persecuting the Christians? It was the church. Back then it was called synagogue. Right? They didn't have the ch actual church at first. But the synagogues themselves were persecuting the Christians. And then once the churches got established, people would come into the churches and persecute Christians in the churches. False teachers. Now here in Revelation chapter 13, it describes the second beast, this religious leader. John says this, Then I saw another beast. See, he's already seen the first beast, the political leader. Now he's seeing the second beast, the religious leader. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. Let me, let me ask you, who is the lamb? Jesus is the lamb. Who is the dragon? Satan is the dragon. So, when, when John sees this beast, it says it looks like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. It's making itself appear as if it was Jesus Christ, your Messiah, your Savior. But it's not. When it speaks, its words are from coming right from Satan himself. And many people will be deceived by this. Because it will be done in the name of Jesus. The Antichrist, the false Jesus, the false Messiah, is going to be leading the false Christian church. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. And makes the earth and its inhabitants to worship the first beast. So this religious leader is tied directly in with the political leader. He exercises all the authority of the political leader. And he makes the whole earth, whole earth and all its inhabitants worship the first beast. We gotta be careful who we hold up as heroes in our hearts and in our lives. We don't ever want to be worshiping another human being in any way. Here in Luke, It, Jesus, Jesus actually said this. Before all this, they will lay their hands on you and they will persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will rot, be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. So he said you'll deliver up to the synagogues. That's the houses of worship, the religious people. And you'll be brought before kings and governors. That's the political. Jesus himself warned us about this while he was still alive on the earth. He warned us about the combination of religious and political power that would one day persecute the true Christians. John 15... 16... 16... See all I'm getting there. John 15, 20. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than the master. If they persecuted me, says Jesus, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. John 16, verse 2 to 3. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do all these things because they have not known the Father or me. Did you hear that? That's a pretty stern warning. The hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. So when we get to that tribulation period that's in Revelation, when we get to these end times, 
We're going to be persecuted in the name of God. It's very clear in the Bible that that's going to be the case. We've got to make sure we're on the right side of things. Jesus also said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous and wolves. They're pretending to be Christians, but they're not. Now, anytime you talk about there being a false religion, a false part of Christianity, and a true part of Christianity, you kind of have to define what you're talking about, right? If I just throw it out there, there's a good, true Christianity, and there's a false Christianity. If I just threw that out there, you'd be like, well, what are you talking about? How do I know which is which? Because you know? one, anybody can say, I'm on this side or I'm on that side. Now, some people believe that the difference between true Christians and false Christians is based on their theology. Based on their theology. Some theological belief. In fact, most cults and a lot of churches, they have one or two little verses somewhere in the Bible that says something, and they base their whole religion on that one little thing. And if you don't believe that one little thing, you're not saved. For instance, baptism. To me, if you're baptized, you're going to be baptized because you want to be Christian, you want to serve God. And some people, in fact, people that we know personally, if, you, if you're dumped in the water and the preacher says, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, which is what it says in the book of Mark that we should do, let's say you are not saved. If you're baptized in the water and you say, I'm doing this in the name of Jesus, then they'll say, you are saved. So based, based on just a few words differently, a little bit of theology, they're going to tell you, you're saved and you're not, you're the good church, you're not. And there's other issues like the, the Sabbath, the Saturday Sabbath or the Sunday Sabbath or keeping the Sabbath at all. Many churches will condemn you if you don't keep the Sabbath the same way they do. But I, I would never do these things. I don't believe the thing that separates the good from the bad is your theology. Some people say you have to be a member of their church. Only their church is saved. I say whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I don't believe that either. Some people teach it a strong morality. They're always preaching morality. Don't do this sin, don't do that sin, live a perfect life. Some churches believe you can live perfect, that you can be perfect and never sin. And I don't believe that. I'm 65 years old and I haven't figured it out yet. But they'll judge you by your morality and say, you're saved or not saved, because maybe you drink or you smoke or you dance or whatever their thing is. I would never say that. I don't believe that. What do I say is the def defining characteristics of being a true Christian? Your attitude, your personality traits, your desire for the Lord. We read the Beatitudes last week. And I encourage you to make a copy of that and hang it up and read it every day. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 through 14. If you read the Beatitudes, if you're a Christian, you're becoming more and more like the Beatitudes. You're on the right side of things. If you see another a preacher or a group or anybody, and they're becoming more and more like the Beatitudes, which is meekness and humility and forgiveness and kindness and love and peace, all those things. When I see people ranting and raving, when I see people full of anger in the name of Jesus, when I see people attacking and assaulting people in the name of Jesus, I know that's not of God. That's not the true Christianity. That's the false world. Also, we have in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, the fruits of the Spirit. Love, peace, patience, kindness, long-suffering, self-control. It lists all the things that we should be showing in our lives. And that's how we can judge ourselves and others on those bases. Also, it's clear to me that to be a Christian is to do good works. Good works to help other people. We've, we've had people, we had a Bible study years ago, and some people left the Bible study because we wanted to help the poor. And they didn't want to help the poor. They blamed the poor for being poor. And they didn't like the poor. They didn't want to help them. But Jesus said, point blank, in the parable of sheep and goats, if you didn't bring water, if you didn't bring food, if you didn't bring clothes, if you didn't visit and care for the sick, if you didn't visit and care for people in jail, if you didn't do these things, I don't even know you. I don't even know who you are. 
So to me, the two biggest things to look for in our own lives and others is are we following the Beatitudes with humility and meekness and peace and kindness and love and forgiveness? And are we doing good works to help others? To me, that's the two, two is true signs of being a true Christian. And when persecution arises, our reaction to that should be becoming a better Christian, becoming more like Jesus. We don't get an army together and go attack. We don't yell and scream and get mad and seek out revenge, paybacks. That's not the way of Christ at all. You read in the book of Revelation, as the story unfolds, the Christians are being persecuted. The story never says, well, the Christians got tired of it. They got together, they, got, they armed themselves, and they started a little army, and they beat the beast. Yeah! That sounds like a good movie plot, right? But that's not the plot of the Bible. That's not the plot of Revelation. The Christians live in humility, kindness, forgiveness. And our objective, no matter how bad things get, is to be more like Jesus. To read that Bible and to live by that Bible. That's what our objective is. I might read just a little bit more. Ah, turn the page on. There it is. I'm going to go back to 2 Timothy for a minute, chapter 4. So I solemnly urge you before God and before Jesus Christ who will someday judge the living and the dead when he appears to set up his kingdom. So Jesus Christ is going to come back. There's going to be a resurrection. All the dead are going to rise and be judged by Jesus. And here's what he tells us to do. To preach the word of God urgently at all times. Whenever you get the chance, in season and out. When it is convenient and when it is not. What's he telling us to do? Get angry, fight back. He's telling us, no, he's telling us to preach the word of God. Study the word of God, preach the word of God. For there's going to come a time when people won't listen to the truth. But we'll go around looking for teachers who tell them just what they want to hear. They won't listen to what the Bible says, but will gladly follow their own misguided ideas. So how are you going to really know what to do, what to believe, unless you spend time in the Bible? I hope all of you are spending time in the Bible. I'm sure some of you are and some of you aren't. But I highly recommend it. How else are you going to know how to behave, how to live your life for Christ? Well, this series of things I'm doing on Revelation, it's about the end times. It's a little scary sometimes. We don't know how close we are. We don't know if the end times are coming tomorrow or if they're coming thousand years from now. But as we go through this series, we're going to bring forth some information that might help you understand that a little better too. But right now, here we are living our lives. We're in a country that has freedom of religion. We are free to meet like this. We're not being persecuted in any great way. There's no fear that the cops are going to pull up here and arrest me for preaching. No one's going to put us in jail because we have a Bible. We have so much freedom right now. We need to take advantage of that freedom. We need to use that freedom to pray, to get in the Bible, to fellowship, to do good works for God. And if anyone here today has not received Christ, I want to give you an opportunity today to receive Jesus Christ into your heart. Whether you're a regular here, a regular, you've been here for a while, if you want to be certain, or if you're new here, if you want to be certain that Jesus Christ is living in your heart, I want to invite you to come up here and stand with me and let me pray with you. And we'll ask Christ into your heart right now.